Hey everyone, welcome back to Advanced HTML CSS course. I hope you have already been through the basic HTML5 CSS3 tutorials. If not, I would highly, highly recommend that because I would be assuming that you know everything which was discussed in that last course. Now, the motive of this course is to build on top of that knowledge plus give you deep insights into what exactly HTML5 and CSS3 can achieve, what you should use them for, and how to get a better understanding. This is gonna be a thorough course. So again, I expect you to first of all, just complete the basics one because that will just get you started with coding. And in this one, we'll just discuss a lot of things which you would probably not really find anywhere else as a, as a video series or as a video tutorial. So yeah, pay close attention to this course. It's gonna be a lot of fun and a lot of learning if you just follow along with uh, whatever material is given. So that is all for this video. Hope to see you very soon in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, let's just go ahead and first of all discuss what HTML5 exactly is. So I'm gonna go to playgrounds and open an HTML5 playground right here, which is gonna give me access to my own little environment where I can just play around with HTML and CSS for the most part. So let's open the index.html file and you can see we already have some contents from this file. So let's just go ahead and remove this and start from a clean slate. I'm also gonna just get rid of this so that we have more space with us for the IDE. All right, so first things first, what is HTML5? Now we have already discussed HTML in depth and you know, all those things like simple tags and all that stuff. But if you think about it, HTML comes with a number in front of it, right? Why that is a number, HTML5, this five is the fifth sort of version of HTML specification, right? So what you have to understand is that there are certain people who are responsible for, you know, just, just sort of designing the spec of HTML, like what exactly HTML should consist of all these, you know, inbuilt tags, the P tag, the span tag, the diff tag, which you see, this has been thought of and created by somebody, right? So these people, this is a community of people, these people sit down and when they think that, you know, there's an update necessary or we should take browsers to the next level or, you know, whatever they think, they have to draft out a new specification. This specification is just a document which browsers like Google Chrome and Firefox and Safari and all other browsers have to follow, right? Now specification just lays down that, you know, this should be the tag, this should have this behavior, this should be this behavior, but it does not tell them, uh, you know, it does not really contain any code or anything, right? So it's just a specification, right? So in a, if you are cooking a recipe, you just get the recipe. You don't really get the ingredients and all that stuff. You do, you have to do it yourself. Similarly, this community is just responsible for drafting out a specification and then the browsers have to follow and implement them. So what exactly is HTML5? HTML5 is the revision of HTML 4.1. So the last version of HTML uh, before HTML5 was HTML 4.1, which had certain tags, certain things here and there. There were some changes, but for the most part, it is not really necessary for you on day-to-day -day basis to know, uh, you know, things and differences between HTML 4.1 and 5. All you have to remember is that in HTML5, you have to start the doc type like this, that's it. HTML 4.1 had a weird doc type HTML, which was huge and you have to probably copy paste it all the time from your older projects or from other websites. And the next thing you have to sort of remember is that there is a little bit of semantics change in HTML5, <clears throat> right? So by semantics change, what I mean is that there are certain more things you have to like be sure of if you want to pass all the accessibility and all the HTML5 validator test. But for the most part, you don't really have to worry a lot about other stuff, right? So in a nutshell, HTML5, first of all, brings a lot of new support to browser in terms of, you know, video tags, embedding videos and audio tags. And we'll also take a look at canvas later on when we are doing JavaScript things. So these things, these are new tags which have special uh, sort of uh, functionality, right? 
and these are like very limited tags in html once you realize that most of the stuff most of the html tags like you can see p span div all these tags you can just manipulate using css and they'll just behave like any other tag uh, so there are not there are not there are not a lot of tags in html specification which you would say have very special meaning except for you know just like i said video or you know image or as a matter of fact audio or canvas i can just remember these handful of tags right which have a special meaning other than that most tags are just you know convertible with the help of css but the actual meaning the true meaning of html is to convey meaning to a particular let's say a particular software just assume a software which cannot really see your web page but if that software is able to determine that hey this is how the web page would probably look like that means you have written correct html what do i mean by that let's say you are creating a website where you have a header a footer uh let's say a content area in between so in html 4.1 what you would probably do is just to have div id header you know div id footer and maybe like div id content right this is although this is fine but what html5 says the more html 5 way of doing this is actually using the semantic tags so html5 brings in a header tag right html5 brings in a footer tag and html5 also brings in for example let's say a section right so just to define some sections if you want to have a sidebar there's also an aside tag so all these things uh you know these new tags exist in html5 but we're not going to go into very depth of these in this because i want to cover other other important things these things probably would be more interesting if we pick up an accessibility course or something like that but that is something for some other day so that is yeah that is what html5 essentially is more semantics less of doc type html thingy and uh, more or less the same html as before so that's all for this video i'm going to see you in the next one really soon hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and discuss about meta tags meta tags is a very interesting thing and as a sort of a front end web developer if you're working in a company or in a startup which wants to have seo that is search engine optimization meta tags are going to be your friend why because you know meta tags serve a lot of information to these bots and crawlers and search engines about what your page is or how your page you know what your page contains as as a sort of a header information so by now you might have guessed that meta tags goes into a head section and uh, they are not like you know you don't really have to close them just like image tags so it starts with you know just meta keyword but it obviously needs to have more sort of information so the first tag which you know the first thing which you'll actually see which is sort of like required in html as well i guess is meta char set and then you have to specify utf8 here what this really means is that when your browser is reading this document it means that whatever characters you're going to be using are going to lie in the utf8 char set so if you go to like wikipedia page of utf8 you're going to you can go ahead and read more about uh what utf8 is but it's it's more like you know if you read about it is capable of encoding all the uh what is it? what is it? 1 million over a million characters code points in unicode right so yeah this is basically that this means that you will not be using some weird sort of character which is not present in unicode right and if you are using it i don't know probably your browser might just not display it in the way you like so this is like informing the browser right and other people like search engine could also use this to get information the next thing is that you know there is sort of a variant of meta which is interesting i'll tell you why and that is http equivalent right or eq i don't know if this is equivalent or eq but yeah that's how you spell it what this tag is is that it can sort of mimic how the response comes from a backend now hear me out 
in your uh, the fundamentals of html uh, fundamentals of http course which you have taken for the front end developer learning path you have learned how websites work right when you visit a url like this if i go to console inspect don't worry if you don't know about this interface we'll actually learn this in chrome dev tools course so if i refresh this you can see that we have a couple of requests here the first one is the request which i'm looking for so you see we have certain response headers which tells some information right so in a similar way there are a few things a few values which you can use here which will mimic as if uh, it is coming as a response header right now this is not you know something which you'll use very often this is actually a rarely used thing but when you need it it's pretty cool i'll give you one example which is like the i think the 99% of the times you'll use this is because of this and that is to refresh your page on the html level right so if you're if you have a little bit of experience with javascript you know that you can refresh with javascript but did you know that you can actually refresh your page automatically with html itself without actually involving any user click or anything like a link click you can do that by saying http eq is refresh and then your content will actually uh you know be a duration in which you want the content to refresh let's say every 5 seconds and i'm going to have a body here and i'll just say i am refreshed right let's see if we can observe that so you see i am refreshed is here i have selected this text and within 5 seconds you see the page refreshes and you can also see that the request here is you can see a request from the server right so if i select this again after 5 seconds it should probably just refresh right so it just refreshes automatically so this is how you can automatically refresh with html not the best use case but i'll tell you i'll tell you a little secret if i refresh this page itself what you're going to see is that when your playground is loading you're going to see this nice uh, you know this interface right this interface right here refreshes every 3 seconds to check if your uh environment is set up right and the way it does that is using the same sort of uh http eq right so that is that is one use case so we are using it on on code dam itself which i just showed you so anyway this is like one way of uh http eq using http eq the other ways which are most common with meta tags are basically using the name and the content format so you're going to have meta name as uh, for example let's say description and content is going to be something like uh, this is a recipe website for let's say pizzas right so let's say you're creating a personal blog on how to make best pizzas or how different pizzas are created or made and uh, you want your website to be indexable that is if somebody goes to google and types how to create a pizza you want your website to be probably shown right so this is how you can make sure of things like these this is like a first step you should do in order to optimize your on page seo that is you should have correct meta tags meta description title of the page you know title how to make pizzas then there's also a meta name keyword as far as i remember but i think google does not really support it anymore but you know you get the idea you can just go ahead and read about seo meta tags if you want uh but yeah this is how that's that's basically the use case of meta tags in terms of seo and we also saw an interesting use case with that uh http equiv right So yeah that's that's basically it to meta tags nothing related to as such uh, your page that is why it is actually called meta because this is meta information to your page right so it's not really meta tag would not really affect your page anyway except for that http eq refresh uh, so it will just be a very quiet sort of tag and would be just sitting on your page that's it so yeah that's pretty much it for this video I'm going to see you and discuss more interesting stuff about HTML in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just discuss the difference between logical and physical tags. Now, this is a sort of not a 
technical term i have just used it because some people use it and i like it kind of but i'll just explain you what this means so in html from the last course from our basic course you have seen that you can to make some text bold you can say i am bold like this and the browser will appreciate that and would you know just render your text as bold well if you think about it you also have something known as strong tag right strong and bold and strong sort of if you think about it do the same thing so uh you know what what is the difference what exactly is the difference for them now first of all let me tell you how i would have explained this difference 10 years ago right because 10 years ago we would be working on html 4.1 i'll i'll tell you why i'm saying 10 years ago and not right now i'll explain the difference today also but let's assume we are 10 years back right when html 4.1 was the thing so in that time you're going to see that b bold is actually just bolding the text on the screen right strong is also doing the same thing however b tag semantically speaking does not convey a lot of value right what do i mean by that is that well you just say hey i want this text to be bold that is something which you will see as a visual person who can see right assume that somebody is using a sort of a reader which just goes through the web page and tries to read back the content now that particular reader should it like mention is the if the text is bold or would it be like just a wasted sort of opportunity or time right so this b tag basically does not convey a lot of meaning in the semantic world it just says that i want this particular piece of text to be bolded not really you know if this is important or if this is something which should be highlighted distinguished and all that stuff right so you could pretty much just go ahead and bold anything which is which might not be important as well right however when you're using strong you're sort of like you know conveying the message that hey this particular piece of text should stand out right so you can see that even the sort of helper says as the strong element represents strong importance seriousness or urgency for its content but if you check the b element you can see the well it is it is the html5 version but html 4.1 would just say that hey b element is just used to bold the text that's it now let's just come back to html5 and the difference in today's world versus the 10 year old one is sort of like i don't really understand to be honest right it, it's not a very great difference so the spec now says the b element represents a span of text to which attention is being drawn you know without conveying any extra importance and with no implication of an alternate voice or mood such as keywords and document abstract you know all that stuff but strong just says that you have to see this this is serious business right so i don't know like html5 spec is sort of like not really distinguishing both of them very strongly uh you know ironically but uh, yeah so what you should use as a as a person i would say don't really you know think a lot about this use whatever comes to your mind honestly you can worry about these things when you are actually uh you know either learning about accessibility in html which is a very important thing or maybe you know you just want to i don't know just just if you like be or strong personally you can just go ahead and use any one of them but personally i would say just just the semantics says that if you want to drive some attention why not just go ahead and use strong all the time or be all the time or maybe just go ahead and use css as a matter of fact it does not matter right apart from the accessibility reasons if you are assume that the person is going to see your web page it does not matter now what is the uh, the title of the video then logical versus physical tag this is a logical tag right because strong logically says that hey this means something but b right here does not say that in a similar way there's this tag called italics i hope you have heard about this right which is makes the text italics but on the other hand we have this em tag right here which also does the same thing but this tag represents stress or emphasis on its content whereas italics 
again that long description just like we had a had in the bold tag so you know it's basically the same thing so yeah that's that's basically it you're gonna see some elements from html 4.1 world sort of like behave in the same way in the html5 world but their semantics differ a little right you know just like in a similar way you're gonna see that div is a block level element and so is a header but if you're using html5 or maybe like if you're watching this video in html5 world which is obviously true because well i'm shooting this in html5 world then you should probably use this in the you, you should probably use these tags headers and footers where the places are appropriate right if you are creating a header sort of if you are creating a footer sort of then it is better to use these semantics because you know some readers or some uh, softwares which are programmed for accessibility more will be having a much better time in determining what is what on your page so yeah that's pretty much it that's a sort of a simple small introduction a sort of like overview of uh, how html5 semantics are defined and as well as these sort of overlapping tags of bold underline italics and em and strong and all that stuff so don't really worry a lot about them but i just thought you should know about all this stuff so that's all for this video i'm gonna see you in the next one hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just discuss something about conditional comments in html now remember before you watch this video this is an old topic and you should never really use conditional comments i'm just telling you this because if you see somewhere in any source code you should not be like scratching your head that what the hell does this even mean so what conditional comments used to be in html they are not really used at all now is that with internet explorer you could sort of hack your way around to run certain html code only if your browser is internet explorer in in some way or another right now what does that mean that means that ie that is internet explorer shipped with certain hacks within the comments of html you know you can start and end a comment like this and a comment usually should not be like you know passed at all by any sort of engine or anything but what ie had was sort of a silly feature or i don't know why that was maybe because of compatibility reasons but yeah not existed right and how you could tap into that is you would just say if ie like this and you know you would not close this comment right so you will keep it like open without the double dash and then you'll something say something like this why the if are you using internet explorer in 2021 right and then you would say something like end if i think i remember it correctly i don't know about i don't remember the syntax exactly but it is probably something like this so you can see nothing happens nothing appears on the page really but if you were to take this url right and maybe if you're following this video right now you're on your own playground and if you take this url open an internet explorer ie 8 or 9 or 10 and open that page you would actually see this text on the screen right so that's 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 sort of like a hacky thing with internet explorers and how people used it was like including a style sheet here link rel style sheet you know href ie only dot css right so this way you could just target you know you could actually target versions as well ie 9 then you can have a block here for ie 8 then you can have a ie 8 only ie 9 only and on their respective versions this would just work fine but this is a super hacky way of coding a web page right because you don't really want your css to be browser dependent that's like you know browsers in the, in themselves have their own different ways of handling css and html and then you are specifically targeting browsers and that too with browser numbers so this is like a insane amount of developer work and technical burden right i'm just i'm just telling you this because you should know if you see any comment like this or any sort of close equivalent of this 
that probably means that website really needs a redesign right in 2020 and 2021 so yeah that's pretty much it for conditional comments you could probably you know you have a not ie sort of comments as well but i'm not really going to get into that because that's not really something you should know about anyway but yeah if you saw the syntax anywhere just remember this video and just blow that source code up and code that css again or html again or whatever it is so that's all for this video i'm going to see you in the next one hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and review something known as non breaking space which might come handy sometime if you are just playing around with html so let me just go ahead and add a quick paragraph right here and let's say i want to create another one and i want to say this this paragraph has many spaces right so you see i wrote a lot of spaces right here even if i give it a lot of spaces you're going to see that nothing really happens in the html output you actually see that well it appears as if there is no space or there's just single space right now html by default has the tendency to collapse multiple spaces into one and there is a way there is an actual internal tag in define tag which is known as pre tag which preserves the space so if i go ahead and scroll you can see that it actually you know has a scroll bar for you know now having so many spaces but the idea is that a regular tag like p or div is just going to ignore these spaces right now sometimes it's fine i mean most of the times it's fine and other times when you really need to just you know just value all the spaces and display them you might go with options like pre and everything but there are times i mean you'll always face always come up with those times if you're a seasoned developer when you just want to have a quick space without actually bothering anyone right or maybe like just a little space so for those times you have a special character known as non breaking space and in html how do you enter that is you use ampersand right nbsp and a semicolon this whole thing is super important it should start with ampersand it should be nbsp and it should contain semicolon right otherwise things will not work so this right here what you are seeing is an html entity right i think i remember another one copy for example you see this copyright symbol yes you can go ahead and copy paste this right here and it will still appear like the same thanks to the utf care set but ideally what should be your you know if you do not have that character on your keyboard or maybe like you know if there's a uh i don't know if there's you know there's auto complete wow amazing let's see if we have uh greater than yes so let's say i want to say for example i want to say this text p tag is an amazing tag right so i cannot do it now right because you know it treats this p tag as an actual element so how do you how do i do this well you convert these angular brackets into their equivalent html entities and the way you do it is you write ampersand less than ampersand greater than and that's it now you can see p tag is an amazing tag right similarly just like i said let's say if you want to have multiple spaces in between them you have to use nbsp because if you do not it will just collapse your white spaces so now you can see that each individual space is a non breaking space it does not really you know collapse into a single one because if you replace all these spaces with the all these spaces that is the breaking space you're going to see it just you know does not work similarly you can probably play around more by just googling html5 entities or html entities and you're going to have a lot more uh sort of uh entities available for you you know all sorts of weird symbols so yeah that's pretty much it a little introduction to what html entities are and what nbsp is personally i have used like nbsp more than anything else so yeah that's that's why i wanted to you wanted you to know about it so that's all for this video i'm going to see you in the next one really soon hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and take a look at some input values basically all the common input values you're going to see and uh, yeah these are 
the typical values you're going to use in a in a form sort of interface right so you if you have a form and if you just go ahead and start writing these input boxes input types you're going to see a lot of different sort of things so first things first i'm going to start with input type text because that is like the most common and thing which you're going to use all the time and you're going to see that it sort of creates this nice little area where you can just enter some text right now this also comes with a lot of uh, you know autocomplete and all that stuff and feel free to just go ahead and read about them you know there are attributes like min length max length all this stuff but this is more inclined towards form validation which we'll quickly see in the next video but let's say if i want to have max length of three right now if i try to type i cannot really type more characters than three right even if i try to copy this url and paste it right here you're gonna see it stops me at htt that's sort of like a little validation you can have from html5 without actually just jumping into the javascript world right then if you just go ahead and see min length min length is probably gonna fail if you try to submit the form right so we don't really submit the form yet but you know if you try to submit it like on a two it's just it's just gonna fail so anyway uh we have this then i don't know there are like a million attributes you can play around with but i'm just gonna, not gonna describe all of them because that's probably useless you're not gonna be using them all the time also so anyway this is our text attribute one yeah one interesting one is a placeholder right so placeholder sort of is the ghost text which will appear on your input fields so i'm going to say enter your name here right and you can see this is the ghost text right it's not really a value i can once i start writing over this that text disappears and once i remove this text that text appears again so it's pretty cool right just to convey information within your input field so that's that's one thing and one one cool thing about this is that it works with passwords as well so if you have for example in earlier we used to do like value as into your name here and then when you click on it we'll just remove it using javascript but you know value differs at, in the way that it is actually uh the text which is present by default placeholder is not just like we saw the next thing similar similar to input type text is input type password again super common to use but you can see right here you cannot really type just text you see once i copied this text what it tried to do is it actually just copied only the number bits right so you can see that this whole thing is a number e is also a number it's basically you know representing the power of 10 or something but i don't know but you can see that it's sort of like tried to copy only number and plus it gets these sort of increment and decrement for free from the browser itself so that there's that right so this is one thing next one is uh, you have let's see input type file which allows you to actually have you know this nice little interface from the browser itself now this all this stuff depends on browser to browser right some browsers might have a different sort of interface for picking up a file but this thing just allows you if you click on this it will open the file explorer of your system and this will allow you to pick a file right super old super common all the time we have been using as web developers next thing you could have is input type email and again this is an html5 sort of thing why because uh let's see first of all let me just add input type summit value summit form right and if i enter a required attribute here that means this is required let's say if i try to summit this okay summit this you can see that we get an error from the html5 that is from the browser itself that please include an at the rate in the email address this value is missing an at the rate so this is an inbuilt validation uh, from the browser itself from the html5 interface itself so this is sort of like where you would not want to use text over uh, email right because this is a much better option similarly this brings me to an important point is that that is if you have an invalid sort of attribute by default it fall backs to text always so your text is like the sort of fallback for any anything and everything which is invalid and this means this also means one thing that if a particular thing let's say a uh, cutting edge sort of thing i think color is one i don't know 
yeah you can see that color sort of allows you to pick one color which is a pretty cool thing if you ask me so this color attribute right here although is pretty cool but it might not be supported in all the browsers which you try to browse so they will fall back to input type text right so that's how it works so anyway moving on what we can do next what we can sort of like discuss is input type search this is also pretty cool i like this one this is a pretty much a input type text but with a cross button you see when you type it automatically it gives you a cross button which when you click on it it clears the text and that's basically it right pretty you can just go ahead and achieve the same thing with a very small sort of javascript and css lines but it's good to have sort of internal uh features like this also so there's that then you also have input type range right and once you do this you can specify a min and max here which makes much more sense minimum one maximum 100 right and once you do this it's sort of you know you're not really sure of what where the value is you can add a little bit of javascript magic here to reflect the value but you, i think you can also specify a step function not really a function of value step of two right so this increments and decrements in twos so the minimum value that could be is two in this case and maximum or maybe like not really two but one and maximum could be 99 why because you start from one all the way to 99 if I probably just keep it like 30, you're gonna see how this differs. So you can see now it just increases in chunks of 30, right? It starts with 1, 31, 61, 91. That's it. You cannot really go further. So there's that. Another one is common input type <clears throat> checkbox, right? You know, you might have seen this all the time. Do you agree? to sell your data that's what google asks you right when you sign up your account you check this nicely and you click on submit so that's how you create it for your own website as well and yeah that's pretty much it i think i can just remember a couple of more input type date time or maybe like it was just date i don't know input type date once you do this yep you can see it has a nice interface for picking up a date and this is all provided from the browser itself right there's no javascript no plugins at all but again it comes with a cost that different browsers will have different interfaces so if you want consistency then you might need to go for a javascript option but yeah this sort of really works without somebody just using javascript at all which is also pretty cool you also have a date time sort of thing right so if you just don't really want date time uh you know date for the person there used to be a date time but you can see it is now deprecated it's actually removed not even deprecated so there's this date time local thing right which allows you to pick not only the date but also the time so you can select let's say i don't know let's say december 31st 12 a.m new year's time hopefully everything would be fine in 2021 let's assume and let's hope and there we go you can have a submit button and that will do the job so anyway that's that's another one in the bag another one which i can think of is probably input type button right so for example i don't know this might be just for fun or playing and I, I haven't really seen any use of input type button in the wild but uh, yeah you could probably use it for loading data or something but because there's already a button tag that's why that's why i'm saying but if you have an input type button just for fun you can have something like this and it'll just appear like a button a regular button you can just mess around with it it will not submit the form because submitting the form is the responsibility of input type submit which you already have right so yeah that's that's pretty much it for uh this video i think i have covered a lot of buttons and stuff you have like one more thing to go i would just say input type i'll just go ahead and you know make sure that all the inputs are block level so that we don't see them in line so input display block nice and easy and now i can just go ahead and add input type radio also a fun and very common option and i can say this is a value one 
Well, this value would not really reflect on the page directly because you have to give it a label here, label one. But this has a fault because, you know, with input type radius, you would often see that you can only select one option, right? So if I'm asking your gender, male or female, so you have to select like this one or this one, right? So this right now it selects both. So we don't really want that to happen. So in order to do that, how HTML works is how it can distinguish between maybe like not really distinguish, but tell that, hey, these are the part of the same group is using the name keyword. So you can group them by saying gender, right? And name gender right here, right? So you can now select this, this, you know, now it does not allow you to select both of them. So there's that. So yeah, that's, that's basically it. I guess nothing much into the input fields. You can pretty much create all sorts of forms and inputs and all that stuff just using these, all these input fields. If you want to learn more, you can always head to MDN and Google stuff. But yeah, that's, that's how much you would need eventually. So that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just quickly go over through what an iframe is. Iframe is sort of a special tag in HTML and one of my favorites because it sort of allows you to, you know, explore your way into external web and actually provide interactivity from external websites without leaving your own websites. And hear me out, there's a big asterisk over there because not all websites, in fact, most websites don't allow that this to happen. Let me tell you how this happens, first of all. So I'm going to have an iframe tag and I'm going to give it an SRC of let's say codedam.com because I know it is not restricted as far as I remember right now. Yeah. So you can see this web page, this 16135, whatever it is, is able to load codedam.com like this. And it sort of loads in the mobile preview because the iframe is a small. So what's happening here is I can just go ahead and say codedam for mobile version right and i could sort of like give you a look and feel of how this would behave in a mobile version right i can go ahead and say iframe width width 300 height 300 and i'm going to just say border zero so that i just remove this thing right so now you can see it's sort of or maybe like border two pixels solid black solid black or if you are more creative <clears throat> you can sort of have a a uh, phone like background right so you would have a very nice interface so you can sort of see like how this thing happens right so i'm actually embedding a whole different domain inside another domain right so yeah that's that's pretty cool actually but you're gonna see most websites like for example if i try to embed google.com you're gonna see that you pretty much get nothing and the reason for this is if I just go ahead and open this in a new tab and go to the console to see errors, you're going to see that you get a refused to display google.com in a frame because it's X frame or options is set to same origin. What this means in layman language is that Google says that I will not allow myself to be embedded into any website except if it is coming from Google's domain itself right so first of all i'll just i'll just not really go into the security implement implications of why websites don't really allow this but you can think of uh you know in this way that this this sort of behavior is not secure even i should not really allow <clears throat> this to happen but for now it sort of works so if you're seeing this in future and codedam.com does not work with iframe you know why because i woke up one day and just just decided to make uh this as a security thing on codedam as well but anyway, what iframe allows you to do, you might have seen now, is that it allows you to embed, embed different content altogether from another page itself, right? So one very sort of example, very nice example of this, is that if you want to embed a YouTube video, let me just show you a real simple YouTube video. Let's see if I can find any good. So this is my video from my YouTube channel, Codenam. And I'm just going to go ahead and embed this, not really like this, actually just go back and go to the share section. And right here inside the embed, click on this and you can see YouTube actually gives you an iframe code again, 
you can see it's not really giving you any nasty scripts or anything but it's actually giving you an iframe code with an src attribute pointing to something like this youtube.com embed in this and all the other stuff right so you can probably look up this if you want uh, but this just means you know having certain api accesses but this means that now you have embedded a youtube video nicely on your website if you go ahead and open this url in the new tab you're going to see it sort of looks like the same way how this website how this video was embedded and that's why it appears like this right in the nice embedded form one thing you do have to remember is that don't really try to go ahead and iframe a lot of things why because you know it's not really something you should just be bothered about if you're doing like 5 10 iframes i'm talking about like 100 or 200 iframes per web page because when you do an iframe embed the browser actually creates a sandbox environment for that particular page as well so everything um in this uh url is running in its own sort of container so you can think of you know this might be a bad analogy but you can relate to it you can think of a single iframe as a single open tab and we all know that if you try to open multiple tabs on chrome or any browser it sort of like becomes very sluggish so this is same thing with your website because your website every single iframe is running in a in a sort of a sandbox just like every single tab is it would create performance issues real quick if you try to just go very convenient with the iframe embed thing right so this is like something you should remember so yeah that's pretty much it for iframes so when you need them you can use them um, if the website owner allows so yeah very convenient for example right now i'm embedding the response of this domain as an iframe in this website right so if, the more you know how code dump works so you can see this website this response which you see is actually from this url and if you just go ahead and try to take a peek into this you could see right here you would be able to see that this is an iframe right so that's how it works so yeah that's pretty much it for this video i'm gonna see you in the next one really soon hey everyone welcome back to the advanced section of css now we're gonna start with that and in the last course in the html css basics one we discussed about css selectors how you can select elements how you can style them with certain properties in this one let's just go ahead and start with some advanced things the first one being the specificity of a css selector let's just go ahead and create a style here color red and if we go to like the html document you're going to see that we already have a p tag here and the style sheet link so that's fine now in this say in this case i'm just going to go ahead and create another style let's say color blue in this case so you can see now it applied color blue right earlier it was color red so how does css determine what to do is it like you know random is it like what is the order so the first thing you have to remember is that every selector you use in css has a you can think of as a sort of a score right and every uh, selector having a particular score if that score is more than a competing selector for that particular particular element then that style would be applied for example i'm going to leave this example for now we're going to come to this later on for example let's just throw in a div tag now and i'm going to say p inside a div right now we can see both of them are blue at the moment but the moment i change this to div p you're going to see the first one right here turns actually red right even though we defined it above and it, it's not not like you know it's not uh sort of overridden by blue which happened before right so what's happening here what's happening let me just go ahead and actually write a p color red here as well just to make things clear right so earlier we had this now we had this whole thing but now this works for the div tag so the specificity of this selector right here let's let's just calculate that i'm gonna have a comment specificity like this and the specificity for this selector is two why because it's one plus one i'm gonna give it like this 
every selector every html element as a as a tag name every tag name rather has selector 1 has a specificity of specificity of 1 you can even see this thing in the in the sort of uh you know sort of information this right here you can see if i hover over this this has just a specificity of 1 this right here has a specificity of 2 so obviously this has more specificity than this one that's why this style gets applied for the matching element that is the p tag inside div now what about let's say if i had an id of p tag like this now if i go ahead and give a id of p tag and then say color green what's going to happen you can see it turns green right even though we have div p of red and if you hover over this you can see it has a specificity of 100 so what's happening here is you can think of if you have an id then the specificity score of an id is 100 right so the specificity score of this thing right here is 2 whereas for id it is 100 right so it's it's a massive jump in the specificity so specificity just means that hey how specific you are with your selector and the reason the ids have a specific score of 100 is because there could be only one single id on the whole page right so that means you're super specific on what element you're targeting so you should always have a single id on a specific page that's that's how the semantics are laid down and the workings are laid down and uh, if you do not do bad things would happen but anyway you can see it has a very high specificity so yeah that's that's basically one thing first of all the next thing is you can also have a class name right so if i have a not really an id but a class of p tag and if i go ahead and rename this like this you're going to see the specific score of this right here is 10 right and uh, we have a p tag class and let's see we probably again had a little bit of caching issue i don't know yep looks like caching issue so let's just go ahead and open this in a new tab rather and now you can see that it's actually green because you know obviously this has a specific score of 10 and that specific score is still 2 so this is going to win right so there's that um yeah so that's one thing another thing is that if you try to do something magical like id of p tag as well and if you try to chain these two you can do that in css that an id of p tag and no space remember no space because if you give a space that means that it is looking for that children inside the id p tag so right here you can see that this has a specificity score of 110 just like you can see the 100 comes from the Uh, id and the 10 comes from the class name so there's that right so yeah that's that's uh, its specific score again much larger than 2 so you're going to win now what you can do is uh, probably nest more select selectors for example if you are competing between these two elements the way you can make this particular element win over everyone else is probably by throwing in more selectors like this right so you can now see the p inside div has a color of blue instead of red so if you ever see that there are styles conflicting that means you are applying something but something else is being shown the first thing you should go do is go ahead and open that in the browser obviously open your console we're going to have a dedicated console uh, course on code dam but don't worry about this just open that console go to that element inside this element tag for example this is the element i'm targeting inside the dev tag and you can see right here we see a style which is crossed so if your style is crossed that probably means that another super style is overriding it right and you would probably be able to see it just above that so if i go ahead and remove this you can see if the style was not present then that would work but if you you know just if you see their style is crossed that means some other style is specificity some other style specificity is more than this one that's why it why it is overriding it 
right? So that's that's a little bit course on specificity. Coming to our first problem, that is, if you have a conflicting score of specificity, the style which is applied is the style which comes later, right? So this style comes later, that is why it is applied. If you just cut and paste this one, this would be applied, right? It's not a big deal. So that's 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 how it all works. So yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it how this specificity thing works in a nutshell. So yeah, that's it for this video. I'm gonna see you in the next one discussing more concepts about CSS. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, we will be discussing box model in CSS3, which is a super important concept overall. If you are learning about CSS3, this and layouts in CSS3 is probably like I keep these two things at the top. Layouts basically means flexbox or grid systems. And uh, if you're a 2015, 2014, 2013 guy, then floats also. So anyway, coming to what exactly is box model in CSS. Box model in CSS basically means how you kind of like display the element on the screen, right? And its properties. So let's start with a simple div tag. I'm gonna give it this a border of five pixel solid black. I'm gonna give this a padding of 10 pixel from every side. I'm gonna give this a margin of 15 pixel and I'm gonna give this a width of 300 and a height of 300. This is like gonna, or let's just give it a 400 height. This is gonna like clear up everything in your mind, right? And I'm just also gonna give this background color of let's say yellow, right? That's it. And we can just have a div of hello world right here with us, right? So this probably needs to also have a link rel. Style sheet, href, style.css, and there we go, right? So we have this, but I'm just gonna open this in a new tab, right? And right here, we have a nice little div with us. Hello world with a background, with a border, all the good stuff. But let's just go ahead and take a deeper look. I'm gonna go ahead and select this element right here and div right here. Now pay close attention to what all you see on the screen. When I hover over this, you can see, or maybe when I click select this, you can see this box sort of thing appear appearing right here now what this thing appears i think i also have a huh, right so we also have a sort of interface like this so this is the box model of this particular element you see the width and height which i gave to it is the central content width and height so that is 300 cross 400 which you see right here is the you know is the width where width and height where the content could live let me just go ahead and drop the height actually it's it's way too much 300 cross 100 would be probably much better right refresh or maybe like 50 would also do refresh and there we go right so now if i go ahead and hover over this and go to compute it you can see this 300 cross 50 turns that region into a little bit blue that means this is the region for the width and the height the next thing is you have the innermost thing as the content. The next thing on the boundary is padding, right? So your content is always surrounded by padding. Your padding is basically the amount which you specify as how much distance do you want the elements content from the border. The outermost thing of an element is the border, right? So the border right here defines the boundary of your element. And after boundary, is margin this margin right here means you know your distance from other elements or from the outside world so this is like you know uh, sort of the whole box model equation that you start from the content you add up the padding you add up the border and then you get the full element right so this is your full element on the screen so if i have a probably a click event listener or you know any sort of hover effect that would work always work whenever i am at least on the border of the element not really on the margin on the border so if you can see you can observe a quick little thing here and that is that even though i specified padding and border and all that stuff even though i specified the width and the height as 350 
the original width and the original height is actually 330 by 80 if you can zoom in a little right on the on the thing when i hover over this so if i hover over this you can see the original width and height of this element let me just go ahead and see if i can say let's say offset width or offset height width right so you can see the width and the height of this element is 330 by 80 but i specified 300 by 500 5 300 by 50 right so why did it not be that same and the reason for this is that by default the css model which is applied in the browsers is not you know what you would expect otherwise the model first of all has the content and the padding and the border as separate from the original width so your original width is only applicable for the central content however if you want to change this behavior you can do that and the way you do that is you give every single element a box sizing of border box right now what this means is that once you have applied this and if you refresh you can see the box sort of reduced in width and height and the reason for this is because your width and height now include the padding as well. So what do I mean by that? If you go to computed, now you can see your content automatically shrinks according to what it would make it suitable for the whole element to be 300 cross 50. And in this way, CSS determines that, hey, its height, the content height should be 20 because we have a tent in padding, which makes it 40. And we have a 5 5 border which will make it 50 right so if i go ahead and try to drop padding here you're going to see there is no difference in the total width of the box but if i remove the box sizing border box and now if i go ahead and drop padding you're going to see there's a difference in the width and the height because in the last case the width and the height was independent from the padding it was fixed it was constant but if you do not have box sizing border box, then the width and the height depends on the padding and the border. If I enable this again, you can see this does not make a difference. If I disable this, that is the content box, this makes a difference. So this is, these are like two models. By default, the content box is applied, right? Which you can see right here, but you can switch it to border box as well. And this would work fine. Personally, I really, really like border box because it kind of like solves a lot of pain points which you might get because you now have more control over the width and the height of the element itself but yeah it's a personal choice to be honest so yeah that's pretty much it on the border box and content box and the box model of css that's how things really work in css and, and if you know this you probably are you probably would be able to uh you know visualize margins and paddings in a much better way now so yeah that's pretty much it for this video I'm gonna see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome back to another video in which I want to discuss about CSS variables, which is again, something which is new in CSS3. Now what this means is that you can, to some degree, use variable-like thing in CSS. That is, you can assign a value, you can change it using JavaScript, more on that later on when we are learning JavaScript, but you can mess around with variables in CSS. So what does this mean? Let's just go ahead and uh, just create a very simple HTML document here really quick. HTML head opening, head closed, body opening, body closed. And I just have a, let's say H1 tag saying hello world, right? We can also bring in a style sheet, which would be link rel style sheet, href style.css right which is at this file right here so let's just open this and uh, already in the style sheet file we can see we have some content so let's just get rid of this so what we can do next in order to create a variable first of all let's just go ahead and give a background of body color of let's say yellow now what you can do in css is you can create variables just like i said and the way you create variables is the way you write property names however there's a very important difference and that is these variables name will start from two dashes so whenever you write two dashes whenever cssc is two dashes this means the name of the property now is not actually a name of the property itself but it is a variable 
So let's say I want to say BG color and I just want to give this as uh, green, right? Let's see. Now, this variable is defined, right? It is there, it contains the value green, it's all fine and good. However, in order to use this, what you have to do is you have to use the keyword var. Now, this is a sort of a function in CSS which will expect the name of the variable and it is like the full name it's not like you know without dashes you have to specify the full name so you see right now i created dash dash pg color as the green uh, value property name and then i access that using var right and you can see on the right we actually see that the background turns green so this is pretty cool now one thing you have to be careful about when you're using css variables is that it follows a scoping mechanism that means your variable is only applicable to the the particular element on which you are applied uh, on which on which you have written the variable declaration on and the children so that means you let's say if we have a div right here with a div id of some div right so if we have this div right here and if i go ahead and add a sum div and bg div to be let's say red and now i give it a background of let's say uh war dash dash pg div so this thing right here you can see it turns red um but this bg div variable is not accessible in body right why because some div is the child of body or in other words body is the parent of this sum div right so parents cannot access the variables of children, but children can access variables of parent, right? So you can use BG color right here. And if you just remove this, you're gonna see that this in fact turns the div into green. So you can see this happens just fine. However, if you go ahead and try to use, let's say BG div inside this one, oops, nope like this if you try to do something like this this will not work you know you see that the background did not apply because we they cannot see any red so you see that you cannot really transcend the uh, variable sort of hierarchy in css so most of the people who want to have a global sort of variable what they can do is you can you by the time you would probably know that you know if you're applying any variable to body it will be accessible to every everything but sort of the convention is to apply it on HTML, right? Or to apply it on root. And root is just a pseudo selector. We'll discuss more on pseudo selectors um, when we, uh, in the next video, actually, not really in JavaScript series. So this is basically equivalent to HTML. You can think of that. So once you apply all the variables like on the HTML, uh, HTML selector, now you are free to go ahead and make use of them in different tags right so you can go ahead and say body and then background bg color right so that way it will just work fine so this is how in a nutshell css variables work there's one more thing with css variable and that is you can specify a default value by that what you mean is let's say if bg div was not uh, set right so in that case if bg div is not set what i want to do is i want to say that the color should be yellow right so this value right here you can see it is basically the default fallback for the variable right now one thing to remember again is that if the variable value itself is invalid then the fallback does not get triggered right so you could see that if the value instead of red is let's say one pixel which is a wrong sort of value for a background then you can see we do not get yellow right it just does not work so it does not work like you know if if uh the value is not working then we just just fall back to default that is not happening here it just happens if the variable is not set at all that is the case so yeah that's pretty much it for this video uh just the takeaways are that if you want to create variables you most likely want to do them on the html because in css you probably would keep the variable scope global in most of the cases if not you can also have component level access of the variables but that is sort of like in advanced use case i would say but you know you get the idea 
So you can create as many variables as you want, assign them any value. Like for example, you can say uh, div padding and give it a value of 20 pixel. And now you can just apply this div padding uh, to basically like padding. And then you can say what div padding. And uh, yeah, if you ever decide to like change your layouts or anything, you just have to change the value of a single variable. So that is pretty cool if you ask me, right? So yeah, that's pretty much how it works. And uh, that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon. So what is going on, everybody? Welcome back. And in this video, I want to explain calc in CSS. And calc is another function in CSS, just like war was. Right. So this function allows us to access the values of variables. Similarly, calc, if you can think about it from the name, allows you to have computations in CSS on the runtime. And that is again pretty cool feature because you can do pretty funky stuff with that. So let's just go ahead and take a look at how we can make this happen. We have an H1 on the page. So I'm going to give it an H1 right here. And I'm going to say that the font size of this h1 is let's say 35 pixels which is sort of not so you know exciting let's give it a 48 so that we can at least see that it's increasing all right so this is that but what you can do with calc is that how about we try to set this as a dynamic value now with calc if i go ahead and do something like hey calculate this set this to let's say 32 pixels but also add uh, i don't know like uh, to view width to it so now what's really happening is that if you scale up the screen if you could observe the font size is actually increasing let me just go ahead and push this factor to 10 for example then it might be more observable so if I increase the size of the screen, you could see that the text size increases, right? And if I decrease the size of the screen, you can see the text size actually decreases. Now, it does not really follow the uh, sort of ratio of the screen width with the actual text it should be. But, you know, you get the idea. And now if I go ahead and open this actually in a new tab, what we're going to see is that I could pretty much do the similar thing here, right? So it decreases, it increases. And if you go ahead, and this is just a neat little trick, we'll discuss this more in the Chrome DevTools course, which is again uh, on the website itself. But if you go to the computed section, you're going to see, um, not really computed. Yeah. So you're going to see the font size right here is 41.1 at the moment. Now, if I go ahead and increase this, you can see the font size changes dynamically. So you are actually computing it with the help of, you know, Two different units which is not really possible if you are using something like this it's just an invalid value so calc allows you not only to do computations in the same unit I mean you could technically do like 32 pixel plus 10 pixel but it's not of any use if they are in the same units right because then you could just probably write 42 pixels itself you want to do calculations when there are different units involved so anyway you get the idea that uh, you can use calc like this Another thing which you can do with calc is that you can use them with variables. So what you can do is you can go ahead and say something like standard font size and give it like 20 pixel or something. And then you can put uh, like h1 to be, I don't know, font size to be like calc, then variable value of standard font size times two right or you know whatever you want so now if i go ahead and try to use this variable right here what you're gonna see is that this is actually 40 pixels right so if i go ahead and refresh this page we're gonna see that the h1 right here and actually you need to have war here obviously and there we go so now if i go ahead and take a look at computed you're going to see the font size is 40 pixels which is exactly what we observed right and if you wanted to have like a p font size right here and give it like a 1.5 multiplication then you can go ahead and give this to a body right so again pretty pretty cool thing if you want to like you know control everything at a single place and at the same time just make your life much more easy so now you can see that the body right here has a font size of 30 pixels 
because you can see 20 times 1.5 is obviously 30. So that is that. So yeah, I mean, it makes your life much more easy. You can also divide if you want and division would also work fine. This just dropped it to 10 pixels. So you can go ahead and see now that if you see your H1 right here, it's actually 10 pixels. So there's that. One thing you have to pay close attention to is that when you are using addition and subtraction with calc, make sure you put a space in between. Let me just show you what I mean by that. So let's say I am having a calc of let's say 20 pixels, 30 pixels plus 2 EM, right, as the units. So let me just go ahead and refresh this right here. And you can see right here, it works just fine. We get a 90 pixel output. Now, if I go ahead and just remove the space, sort of, What's going to happen is that if you go to the style, you're going to see that this is an invalid property value. And the reason for that is that addition and subtraction expects to be separated by white space. Why? Because this gets translated as plus 2 EM. And that means there is no operator between 30 pixel and plus 2 EM. Right? Oops. So if you go ahead and give it an, another plus right here, then also it will work. Why? Because the earlier was sort of like equivalent to this, right? That means there is no uh, operator between them. So you always want to give a space in front of and before after the operator. And this is like only valid and only required for plus and minus. It is not required for division, to be honest, uh, but it could sort of like be a good habit, right? So if you have like 30 pixel by two right here, if you just go ahead and, you know, not give a space, it'll still work, but it's just a good practice because, you know, it'll just make your CSS consistent. So there's that. So this is like one another thing which I thought was important you guys should know. So yeah, that's pretty much it with calc. It's a super interesting property. You can hack your way around with widths and heights here and there. But uh, yeah, if you're using it, I would say like, try to figure out the reason because if it is a simple use case like layouts or something and if the layout is also you know very standard or typical chances are you don't really need calc right and if you are using it's fine i mean the support is quite good right now uh but uh, yeah it's still not 100 percent right so yeah there's, there's that that's all so that's all for this video i'm gonna see you in the next one really soon Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, I'm gonna go ahead and explain you about CSS pseudo selectors. I think we touched a little bit on pseudo selectors in the basics course as well, but let's just go ahead and formally look at that because this is an important thing, right? And it is like uh, one of the most used parts as well of CSS. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a very simple page here, you know, sort of like about me, and I'm not gonna make use of any selectors right here because pseudo selectors will will cover that right so i'm gonna give it a paragraph my name is bold mehul mohan and uh, i am the founder of code dam right so this is a simple paragraph then i could probably go ahead and create a, a sort of i don't know let's say another paragraph right here which contains my favorite F O F O U R I D E languages, and then I can create a UL, right, which consists of some LIs, HTML, CSS. Then I could also have JavaScript here. Then I could also have React, maybe like Node.js something like this so you know you get the idea so this is this is like a simple page for us now what i want to do is i want to add certain effects to this page right so if i'm let's say i'm hovering over this i want things to happen and that is absolutely possible with css using something known as pseudo selectors now pseudo selector means that that particular element would not really exist on the page but either the state or you know with some user action or something happened which put that element into that particular state right now let me just start with a very simple one which you will be able to like visually see and that is the hover selector so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select li and i'm going to say hey all of you have color background black 
right and color white simple enough however what i want to say that whenever i hover over this li i'm going to say li hover right so what i did is i wrote the name of the selector and then i wrote you know colon this colon right here is important and then the name of the pseudo selector in this case it's li hover and i'm going to say hey once that happens i'm going to have a color of green and background of red right so now if i go ahead and hover over this you could see pretty much that we turn it into green and the bullet disappears because you know it, it matches the background color so that that's why it happens and the background turns red for the li right so you can see that we have sort of added a little interactivity without using javascript at all so that is why you know you can do a lot of stuff with css um, if you introduce animations and stuff that becomes even more interesting but this is like one pseudo selector which is um, you can say sort of a state based or you know user action based selector the user did something which enabled that right then you have selectors for um let's see let's see if i can have a input field right here input type text right and now what i'm going to do is something interesting i'm going to have a let's say div id banner i am visible right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead right here and write input type text or just input because we have a single field and uh, i'm going to say whenever i focus on this input again see that this is a pseudo selector because it is state dependent whenever i focus on this input field what i want to have is that i want this banner to be visible now this is a sort of advanced use case hang up with me here what's going to happen is how i select the uh, the sibling right because in this case this banner is actually the sibling of this input field and the way to select sibling if you did not know it is using the plus symbol so you know hash banner right so you know uh, for example if you have to select every li inside a ul you're going to do ul li this means that the immediate child of ul that is every li so it, it will match a hierarchy which is something like ul and then li but it will not match a hierarchy which is like ul and then div and then li right so this is like one way of selecting immediate children using plus is another way of selecting a uh, sibling right so anyway once we do this you're gonna see that i am just gonna give this a display block right and why i'm gonna do that because on the banner i'm gonna give it a display none so what this means is you can see that there is no i am visible on the screen at the moment and if i click on this you can see i am visible appears right so if i click out it goes away if i click in it appears why why does this work is because by default banner is display none and the moment i select this this input focus event is activated and it sees that hey whenever i have this inputs focus pseudo selector which is currently you know present on the dom if you if you can just think about it in pseudo terms that input focus element is now present on the dom and the banner in front of it should be displayed and if i click out input focus pseudo element is now not present and the banner you know is uh, sort of not there so there's that so it is again sort of like you can think of it's a user based action based pseudo selector and uh, yeah there's that that's that's like uh, one use case as well if you want to have a little bit of interactivity with the visibility of the elements you can go ahead and do that however another which is like the most interesting use case of pseudo selector according to me is the nth child right and the nth child basically allows you to select elements which are not having any you know they could have technically a, a sort of a selector but for example let's say if i want to select only the third li in this ul list how are you going to do that well you can technically say you know you can just go ahead let's say let's say i want to go ahead and select the third li so you can say this ul li selects every uh let's just go ahead and work with this 
ULLI is gonna select everything and I'm gonna remove this as well. So I don't want to do that. I only want to have the third, that is the JavaScript being selected. So you can, you know, do this just like because, you know, I told you how to do that. But you can see it kind of does not work because this li plus li plus li <laughs> selects the last three. And the reason they select the last three, it's interesting, is because li plus li plus li means the li which the li which is the sibling of li which is the sibling of li right so this constraint is fulfilled by the third one because you know this is li plus li plus li but this is also fulfilled by the fourth one because you know this is li plus li plus li and the fifth one and the sixth one so you know this did not work pretty much and to be honest i cannot really think of uh, a way to make it work without any class or id and without nth child so i'm just going to explain nth child so what nth child does is that if i go ahead and write nth child right here and write one so let's see what happens you can see that the html is selected if i go ahead and write nth child 2 you're going to see css is selected if i go ahead and write nth child 3 javascript is selected so i hope you get the pattern here you can actually give it an index and remember this index is actually one based right nth child zero is nothing right so nothing would be selected so you have to remember that this index is one based and not zero based so you can give nth child one two three four and it'll just work just like you know it will just pinpoint select that element but things get very very interesting with nth child why because you can sort of give it a dynamic input as well what do i mean by that let me just go ahead and give it an nth child of 2n now this is a special you know it's it's not like it's it's not like uh, you can give anything except n you cannot give like f or anything it would not work you have to use the variable name as 2n right or not really 2n just the n right here now what does this mean this means that what css engine will do is that it will take this expression right here and will start giving it values right so if i write n what's going to happen if i write n as one what's going to happen we're going to get two so css is selected if i give n value of two what's going to happen is two times two four so react is selected right so if i give two n it's basically equivalent of writing ul ln child like this and then like this right and it is technically equivalent to you know this as well but you cannot really see it because there is no sixth element on the page However, if there were, let's say, another Node.js, then we'll see the sixth element highlighted as well. But this approach, this approach right here will fail with the eighth one. However, if you write, just write 2n, it's just gonna work fine, right? So it's just gonna work like this. So two, four, six, eight, all the, all the odd, not really odd, even in this case, will be having background black and color white. This is also interesting because you can Play a little math here as well you can also subtract so you can see that earlier we had all the odds now we have all the evens uh, i spoke like in the reverse earlier we had all the evens now we have all the odds so you can see it starts with html javascript node and you can also add to the stuff right so if you have done a little bit of uh, you know algebra you know that this is this looks like sort of expression for all the um you know odd natural numbers right so one three five seven nine that is why if you were expecting that html would not be highlighted you were wrong right because this starts filling up with zero right so if you have a 2n minus one expression it will start n by putting it zero right so if you put n as zero you're gonna get negative one which does not make sense so it's just gonna skip that if you put n as one it's gonna be one that is why html is there if you put ns2 it's going to be 2 times 2 4 minus 1 3 that's why javascript is there and so on but with 2n plus 1 you already have if you put 0 you have 1 right however if you do a 2n plus 3 you're going to see that html is not covered now why because this is technically 2n plus 1 plus 2 right and you might see that this is this is not like how calc it's not as flexible as calc so you can have only two expressions at the at the given time so you have to stick with 2n plus 3 but what's happening here is that if you put 0 in this n it actually has to start from 3 right that is why it starts from 1 2 3 
So this is like super cool and super important thing as well when you're working with CSS. If you want to target elements based on, uh, you know, randomness, a little bit of randomness or maybe like a pattern if you want to have, um, I don't know, a different effect on odd and even elements, you know, if you want to have a different effect on every third element, this is also possible. So there's that. That's how you do this using nth child, right? So with nth child, there is actually a little bit of convenience. Uh, and that is like a lot of times people use nth child for targeting first element or maybe like last element as well. So how do you target like the last element? So it's not really a, a, a sort of a way to target last element with nth child as far as I can remember. But what you can do is you can use some more pseudo selectors. The next one is going to be last child. So last child, just like the name says, it's going to target the last child of uh, that particular selector which you are targeting. This means, now remember, this does not mean that will only target one single thing. It means that UL LI matches all these LIs and the last LI in this one is this. However, if I sort of like duplicate this list, it will still target that thing. It will still target the other list. So it targets this one and it targets this one as well, right? It's not like a single selector based. It's just that in that particular selector itself, UL and LI, it has so many options. It has so many options. And out of all these options, it's just gonna target the last one. And obviously if there's just a single option, it's just gonna target that one. On a similar basis, you also have first child, right? So you have, you know, the same behavior and we already covered nth child. So there are a bunch of more CSS selectors. I'm not going to get into depth of every single one of them because if you need them, you can sort of like use them because, you know, if you have like, for example, we can also discuss real quick with the input selectors a little bit, right? So we have an input field right here and uh, following the same sort of strategy for input. What we can say is that uh, let's say if input is uh, I don't know enabled let's see and then if I have a banner in front of it I just want to display none right so you can see right now the input is enabled that is why the banner is not display let's let's assume that there was a button here which disables the input field that is you cannot really enter uh, anything else so if I add a disabled attribute to sort of mimic that behavior you can see now that because the input is disabled now I am able to see the banner. If I remove this, I will not be able to see I am visible. So again, this is also a sort of a pseudo selector. Now there exist a lot of pseudo selectors, you know, checked, uh, disabled, uh, blank pseudo selectors also there, which we can probably show in a much better way. But blank would not work right now because it's it's a it's a in work progress thing. So it will land later on in the specification. If you're watching this video, try out blank and see if it works. If it works, then you're from, you know, a distance future. But uh, yeah, it does not work at the moment with browser. But it is definitely under the spec. So yeah, there are other selectors as well. You're free to take a look at uh, all of them if you want. But that's pretty much what you would need in a nutshell when you're starting off. So that is all for this video. And I'm going to see you in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at something super interesting with CSS and that is the presence of pseudo elements, right? So, so far we have been using pseudo selectors, nth child and all that stuff, but actually CSS brings in pseudo elements as well. What does that mean? You know, pseudo stands for fake and element is basically, you know, what you're writing on the on the screen, right? So what does it really mean to be a fake element? Well, firstly, realize that this is just gonna work with the elements which have an opening and a closing tag, right? By this, what I mean, it will not work, this strategy which we'll be discussing, it will not work with input, it will not work with IMG, it will not work with, um, you know, pretty much like HR or BR or any tag which is self-closing. So with that being said, what I wanna do is I want to jump into my style sheet and let's take example of this banner itself. So I'm gonna have a banner here. I'm gonna give it a color of purple. Let's hope that is visible, sort of. Give it a background of white, why not? 
right? And now what I want to do is I want to add pseudo elements to it. Now, how do you add pseudo elements or sort of how do you target pseudo elements? Is you say banner before, right? And yeah, one quick thing, one very quick thing, I think I missed it. You might see that some selectors use this, this double notation of double columns. Some might use single one, right? So what is the difference? Well, remember that first of all, when you're using double, whenever you're using double, a single is also valid, but not the other way around. For example, a double on this is not valid, right? It is also, it only, the single column is only valid here. Now then why do we use double at all? Well, we use double to denote that the selector which we are, which we are using now is pseudo element, not a pseudo selector. By what do we mean by that? That means that this is actually sort of targeting a DOM element on the page itself. You know, it, it's not really a DOM element. That's why the name pseudo, but it will behave like one. So let's just go ahead and give it a content property. I'm going to explain now. Let's say hello world, right? And what we did is we just wrote a string right here and magically it appears on the screen. Wow. I mean, we did not know that we can actually write with CSS now, did we? Because, you know, we always assume that HTML is the one which shows the text and CSS is the one which, you know, programs all the colors and layouts and all that stuff. But it is actually possible to write with CSS as well. So this is like one way of writing with CSS, right? Another, another thing which I can tell you is that before also exists, there's an after pseudo selector which also exists. So if you go ahead and write after here, you can say by world, right? So there's that. So if I go ahead and open this in a new tab and refresh this, and if we go down right here, I think we are zoomed in a lot on this page. Yep. So if I go ahead and select this hello world and by world, you can see right here, you can actually see in the DOM inspector, uh, there is this before and after element, which you can now actually select, right? But you would not see these elements in you know in regular tags by default unless you do not create them and these elements interestingly enough will only and only appear as as long as you have the content property if i remove this content property you can see the element not only just goes away uh but it is not only visible it it is not also visible on the screen so i can go ahead and give it a width of 200 pixel height of 200 pixel background oops height of 200 pixel background of red okay it does not work <laughs> let's just go in and do it here width of 200 pixel height of 200 pixel background of red you know i can do all that stuff but it will not appear on the page you know if you do not give it a content right as as soon as you remove that content it disappears if i remove this it's gonna disappear even if you give a display block right display block right here it will not appear as long as you do not give it a content attribute content property so there's that right now once you have given it a display block width and height it sort of like behaves like a similar element right you can resize it you can you know have fun with it but obviously, you know, it's still not a part of DOM, right? <clears throat> it's not a part of DOM. That means you cannot reach this element from the JavaScript world. This is an important thing. You cannot ever reach pseudo selectors from JavaScript world. So that is like one thing to keep in mind, right? So this is like a, before is a pseudo selector, after is also a pseudo selector, which gets injected just, you know, if I refresh this page, so you can see right here, if I go ahead and target this hello world before gets injected just um, as soon as we enter the element and after gets injected just before the element exits, right? So there's that. There are multiple other, um, you know, selectors which are pseudo elements, right? Remember these two columns means pseudo elements. One column means pseudo selector these things still work because of compatibility reasons you know but you should always use double 
colons right here just to denote that hey that this is actually a pseudo element not a pseudo selector this is not a pseudo selector right this is a pseudo element you're targeting similarly let's just go ahead and write um, banner and i'm going to give this one a first letter right interestingly enough and i'm going to give this a text transform of lowercase you can see that the hello worlds of the edge of the hello world suddenly turned lowercase now if i go ahead and give it a you know oops if i go ahead and turn this all hello world so that it's much more clear you can see that the edge is small why because i said the first letter of the element the banner should be lowercase right and i can also have a first line right here which is just going to target the whole thing if we did not have like you know this before then you're going to see that it, it actually impacts the uh you know element itself so there's that so this is like uh, this is like how it works there's one more interesting thing i would just like to discuss before we wrap up this video and that is there is actually a way to add um you know selectors on pseudo elements and what do i mean by that let's see let's say if you want to have a hover effect on the pseudo element then what you might think of doing is something like hey i have the banner before selector and when i hover over this what should happen is that the text transform lowercase which is fine but if you check this out it will not work why because you know you're targeting an element which does not exist on the dom tree but what you can do is you can go ahead and hover you can get the state first and then you can say once i hover over this the before state of this is gonna be you know lowercase and i know it sounds stupid that uh, you know this one works the other one does not work but yeah i mean if you want to target pseudo selectors just just sort of like try to put the uh the pseudo if you want to target the pseudo elements try to put the pseudo selector before right so similarly you can go ahead and let's see if we have a i don't know banner hover first letter as the pseudo selector then also this will just work right so no need of having any javascript or anything if you just want to have these simple effects so this is how you know this all sorts of works out so so far you have seen that there are two sorts of selectors the first one is actually pseudo selectors the second one is actually pseudo elements pseudo elements consist of before after first letter first sentence uh, first line actually not first letter first sentence but uh, yeah there might be a couple more couple or so but uh, you know you get the idea that's how that's how you use pseudo elements and pseudo selectors so yeah that's pretty much it for this video in the next one i'm going to cover an attr attribute which is an interesting property which uh, sort of links your css with html world so yeah that's pretty much it for this video i'm going to see you in the next one everyone welcome back and in this video we're going to be taking a look at attr that is the attribute function in css yes yet another function after war and calc and you know all that stuff so let's just go ahead and take a look at what this attr means so first of all uh realize that this content right here is actually a string right so that is pretty cool you cannot have a number right here it will not work you have to have a string irrespective of you know even if that's a number so content property right here always expects a arbitrary string number two is that sure you can use variables here that will just be fine but you can actually use attributes from html element the element which you're targeting directly now what do we mean by that you can go ahead and say attr right here and you can say something like data my text something like this now what this this mean is that if i go ahead and on the banner if i create an attribute data my text and if i give it wow you're gonna see and nothing appears because this should not be in quotes this attribute name should be in you know without quotes so this right here 
you can see gives you wow inside the red rectangle right because because of this thing but what's the point to note here is that you have picked up the value of an attribute which should technically not be visible on the page because you know you should know that data dash anything is like a wild card sort of given to you for putting a random amount of data in html right you can basically go ahead on any tag put out data something else and something value and this will not reflect on the html page it's sort of like a metadata placeholder for every single element right so you could pretty much put in anything right here you know given that it's a valid attribute name and it'll just work fine but with css you can sort of extract up these values right here and it's not just you know it's not just data my text you could pretty much have an id attribute right here which is just gonna reflect a banner right because the id of the element is banner so the attribute function right here you see actually in css4 would ideally support a fallback version just like war supports right so if you have you know an attribute which does not exist like data my one two three or whatever then if the value does not exist you could technically go ahead and write hey here and the value would appear right but it does not work right now because this is a css4 specification and it does not exist in css3 so there's that but anyway as of now you can go ahead and plug in the attributes and it'll just work out of the box so yeah that's pretty much it for this video hope you enjoyed it i'm gonna see you in the next one really soon hey everyone welcome back and in this video i want to just go ahead and take a look at some advanced css selectors and we'll just go ahead and take a look at all css selectors as a matter of fact which are most common and as well as cover the advanced ones because i think i did not cover it um, very well in the basics course so anyway let's just go ahead and start with the advanced ones and we can just cover out the late the basics one later on as well so i'm going to start off with the sibling selector only right something which we discussed so you can see right here if you want to target immediate siblings what we can go ahead and do is i can just go ahead and create two siblings here sibling one let's go ahead and create three instead sibling one sibling two sibling three right or maybe like why not four anyway so you can see right here we have four p tags which are siblings and what do you mean by sibling that means they are the same order in the hierarchy right in this case they are all the children of the single div that means this div is the parent of all these elements and all these elements within themselves are siblings of each other that means h1 is the sibling of this p this p this p this p this p all the this p but not this ul because h1 is sort of like the i don't know like the the brother of the parent <laughs> you know i don't know the name but uh, there's that but anyway you can think of this p right here all these p's to be siblings of h1 and similarly each and everything so for now we're just going to keep our focus on these four right and i'm going to remove or probably like comment out these guys right so that they don't really bug us so i'm going to also comment out this one so we just have you know p tags as siblings so what you can do is you can go ahead and select siblings using immediate siblings using the plus symbol what this means is that hey let's say if i want to select the immediate sibling of this h1 which is p what i can do is i can go ahead and say h1 plus p is color as blue or background color as blue or whatever i can see this one turns blue but the others do not why because this plus right here denotes the immediate sibling right that means this p should be the immediate sibling however if we have another span let's say as an immediate sibling then that span would not get any style why because first of all that is not a p tag and this p will also not get an, any style which it got earlier why because this is now not an immediate sibling however if i move this at uh, one place up you know things get uh, blue again so there's that now there is another sort of way to select sibling and that is you know far away siblings and you know sort of like all siblings as well and that is with the still day sign right which is above uh which is on the left of the one key 
So once you do this, this means that, okay, I want to select all the piece which are siblings of H1. Does not matter if they are immediate, you know, in this case, this one, or does not matter if they are far enough. It'll just go ahead and select all the siblings, right? But remember, obviously remember that is it's not selecting any children or parent or any sort of thing. It's just the sibling stuff. So this is how you work with siblings in CSS. Uh, just to revise, plus is for, you know, selecting the immediate sibling. And the tilde sign is for selecting faraway siblings as well. Now, the next one is the direct child of the element. Now, what does this mean? Let's say if I have a P tag with a sibling or maybe like, like let's say if I have an H1 right here, which is a secret about me. So if we have something like this, what we can do is I have this div tag and this H1, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this and I'm gonna write div H1 and I'm gonna say text decoration underline, right? Which is just gonna underline this text. So you see in this case, both about me and secret about me gets underlined. Why? Because, well, this div and h1 targets both of these tags, this one as well as this one. But what if I only want to target elements which are direct children of div? Now realize that in this case, the parent of this h1 is div, but the parent of this h1 is not div. Div is the grandparent of this h1. The parent of this h1 is this p tag, right? So if this div, which is like the sort of grandparent of this H1, if this div only wants to target its children, but not any other hierarchy down the line, then you can go ahead and use a sort of, you know, this, this bracket, right? Angular bracket. And once you do this, what's gonna happen? And it looks like we, okay. And it looks like the thing is broken or, you know, it seems like the thing is not working. And the reason for this, I'll tell you, if you go ahead and visit this page right here, if you go to inspect, you're gonna see that the DOM, which is computed by the browser, is sort of different. That P has thrown away the H1. And the reason for this is because by semantics, P is not allowed to contain an H1 tag. So instead of P, let's just go ahead and throw a section here, right? So if we have a section, now you can see that our style just works fine, as expected, right? Similarly, if you have a section H1 like this, then only this one gets covered, not this one, obviously. But in this case, uh, only this one gets covered. However, if you just go ahead and just do reiterate, if you go ahead and just do div h1, then both of them will be covered to any depth or any hierarchy. So there's that. That is sort of like another selector you can think of. Um, the next one I would say are pretty much the general selectors which you have worked on. There's another one I could just probably just you know, throw out out there for you. And that is the star selector. The star selector basically matches every single element, right? If you use it on a, on a, you know, sort of global scope, this literally means like every single element on your page. So if I go ahead and give it a color of white, and if I just close it like this, I think I did not discuss important, right? On the CSS specificity video. But yeah, let's just go ahead and make another one for that. But anyway, color white right here, you can see every single element turned white, right? If you just force give it a color, you know, with important, that will actually turn every, literally everything, even the pseudo elements and all that stuff. So this is that. If you want to only div, div to only convert. So you can do pretty much not really div because that is like the main child. If you want to have like section, for example. So there's that. You can see the H1 gets converted. If it had contained like, you know, some more stuff, it will also get converted, right? So the difference between just doing section of color white and section star of color white is important, right? And it is important to understand as well. Right here, what's happening is that you are selecting individual elements as if you are writing section P, section H1, and you know, just all the elements all the way. However, if you, when you do section, what happens is that this property right here is applied to this element and the elements always have a tendency to borrow certain properties from parents like color, font size, all that stuff, if that is not explicitly set, right? So let me just show you a quick example of this. If I have a section, I have a font size 
of let's say 30 pixel then you're gonna see that nothing changes i guess nope anyway you're gonna see that nothing really happens because they already have their own defined font sizes right so they do not need to borrow from parent however if you do section star you're gonna see that everything becomes 30 pixels or let me just go ahead and make it 100 pixels it's crazy big so that's how we can see it right so now we have seen everything becomes 100 pixel but with section alone uh you know things become 100 pixel but uh, if i go ahead and okay well that happens because we do not have a font size specified for h1 that was a wrong size so you can see now if i have a let's say font size of 30 pixels for h1 you can see the h1 does not inherit the font size but the p tags do because you know they are actually uh not having any font size but if you go ahead and if you give a p of font size of 24 pixels as well then you're gonna see nobody inherits however now if you give a section star people start inheriting because you know this this means literally every single element and the reason this is this is not inheriting is because of the specificity reasons now if you go ahead and refresh this you're gonna see on here you're gonna see the star has a very low specificity right and that gets cancelled out however if you remove this then you're gonna see that it actually inherits but anyway that's that's like the crux of it so yeah that is again a star is a special selector then apart from this we have ids i hope you all know about this id for example all i can give it this a div id all and we then target this particular element right like this we also have classes dot all you can give it a class of all and that is one and the same thing the only difference between ids and classes is that id should be unique on a single page whereas class could repeat right so you can make use of this class for some other div as well but if you have given an id of all then well technically nobody's stopping you to reuse this but you should never ever reuse this because it will create a ton of headache for you in the javascript if you do so yeah that's pretty much it for the css selectors video hope you enjoyed it that is all for this video and i'm gonna see you in the next one hey everyone welcome back and in this video we're gonna be taking a look at attribute css selector and the reason i wanted to do a separate video for this is because attribute css selector can have a sort of a you know a detailed explanation and why because it consists of a lot of things so first things first let me just go ahead and remove this and i'm gonna add let's say um i don't know let's just go ahead and create a list again of food so i'm gonna have something like food not good but food and let's just go ahead and remove this i guess we can just go ahead and remove all of this stuff and once you're left with this i'm gonna have an li let's say pizza i'm gonna have an li of let's say burger and what else French fries and uh, uh, let's say paneer paratha. <laughs> Why not? Because you're watching an Indian tutorial. So, anyway, this is a list of four foods. And what I'm going to do next is just going to give a data tag attribute of let's say of uh, mm, let's see good, spicy and i don't know let's see or uh, that will probably not a good example so let's just start with a spicy or you know the variance of what i like huge or big data tag lot and data tag let's say moms <laughs> right so this means now we have these sort of selectors uh, th these sort of attributes for these elements and now we can target them not only the on the basis of you know just the order with nh child and all that stuff we can actually target them on the value of these selectors and how we do that is we do that with the help of attribute selectors so let's just go ahead and first of all get rid of this all this li styling because we don't really want it to bother so i want to give ul li and now i want to give an attribute selector and the way you give an attribute selector is you use these two square brackets and you write the name of the attribute in this case it is data 
tag and then an equal to symbol and you know you want to target the value which you want so in our case is uh, spicy right and now if i go ahead and give it a color of red you're gonna see that the spicy which is just the pizza turns red and this is again independent of the order you can move it down you can move it up because it is actually target targeting on the basis of the value exact value match this is why uh, you know it it sort of works like this independent of the order you can also go ahead and uh, do something like data tag that's it what this means is that hey just go ahead and find all the elements which have at least data tag attribute as uh, as the value set right so if i go ahead and create an li which says something like uh, pepsi right so you can see that this is not going to turn red because this does not has a data tag at all so what you can do is it's actually again an advanced css selector I'm, i have not really discussed it but you can go ahead and select a pseudo selector with not right and i'm going to say li which does not has a data tag and i'm going to give it a color of blue because you know we are getting a confusion so what this means is that hey go ahead and find an element which does not has an attribute named data tag right this meant this meant that li must have an attribute data tag this not right here is again a special sort of selector we could probably go ahead and discuss it in depth but this is a special sort of selector which means that go ahead and select every element which does not match this rule and it's not just restricted to the attribute selector you could pretty much write uh, anything right here like an id of uh, li tag or maybe like uh, a class name you know or just like i said attribute so anything would work but anyway with that being said once you have written something like this you can have this or you know you can just give it a background you can basically play around with it a little if you want right <clears throat> so that's how it works now once we have discussed like the exact match what we can do is we can also target elements which starts with a particular value so in this case uh let's see let's say this i want spicy and i want big right so what i can do is instead of targeting just spicy i want to say every element which starts with spicy should be targeted so in that case i'm going to make use of this caret symbol and then an equal to sign and then i'm going to write spicy now you can see pizza and burger get highlighted as red because they both start with spicy this one is just spicy and this one is spicy and big right but this is going to create a problem for you if you have an order something like big and spicy right because now it starts with big so it not it will not be targeted so there's another way you can actually go ahead and put a star right here which means that hey just go ahead and find every element which contains this word right irrespective of whether it's at start middle or end it should just contain so you can also have big spicy and you know salty or whatever or however you like your burgers but you know it'll still match because this contains the spicy keyword now the other one i think i can remember is uh, the ends with which basically means that you can go ahead and uh, put a dollar sign right here which means that if the selector ends with that particular value that will be targeted so in this case if i go ahead and write big spicy like this you can see that spicy it ends with spicy so there's that now this is like not the best example for starting and ending it will probably it is probably a good example for the star selector but you know you get the idea that if it ends with spicy then also it will just work fine so yeah that's pretty much it for the most common attribute selectors you're gonna get and uh, you can have a little bit of more finer control with a little bit of more ways to select elements but this is like as much as you will need in a in a very long time so yeah that's pretty much it so yeah that's pretty much it for this video as well um i hope you learned something new and enjoyed it and i'm gonna see you in the next one really soon